Fantastic. So, um, before we get to the baptism, um, I want to uh, share some passages from Scripture. And uh, uh, we keep saying we keep saying this 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 week, uh, like this weekend, that you know it's difficult to find something fresh and something different to share um, at Easter because the the story, the passage is so familiar. Um, and and even for me, I've had to to go on a journey of trying to get my head around, try to re reimagine, re-understand um, the reality of the story of Jesus, his life, his death, and, and, and ultimately his, his resurrection. And I, I was sharing with Steve before the service, we were just chatting at the back while the band were getting ready, that I've heard this phrase said so many times that, you know, there's more historical evidence for the existence of Jesus than for Julius Caesar. And I said to him, I keep hearing this phrase, but no one ever quantifies it. Nobody ever explains, like, what, what do they mean by that? What, what is this body of evidence? And, and really what people are saying when they say that is this, the way that history is recorded and, 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 and put together is by two forms. One called oral tradition, which is just where you pass the story from one generation to the next. And the other way is what's called textual criticism, where after events happen people would begin to write and talk about them. And what happens is it was only relatively recently in human history that we thought it was important to write and record. So, like, we're going to be a blessed generation. There's going to be, like, so many accounts and records of what we did with our lives, so many selfies and photos. In the future, people are going to have no difficulty imagining what life was like in 2023. But when you think back into the past, how do we know what life was like in the ancient world? Well, the reality is this, is there were people who wrote about those events and those things that were going on and the amazing thing is this about the story of Jesus that more people wrote about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus than many other historical events in the world at that time but the other thing that marks it out as significant is this is it was only a few years after most of the accounts of Jesus life and ministry and death and resurrection were written within a hundred years and this is almost unique amongst ancient history and it makes you wonder, what was it about this story? What was it about this man and his life that got the world's attention? I was doing a bit of research this week and, and, and reflecting on what is it about the story of Jesus that is so important. And, and the message that I want to share with you this morning is this, is we need to believe the, in the purpose of the resurrection. That as followers and believers in Jesus, there is a purpose, there is a plan that God was at working that we see finished and complete in the resurrection of Jesus. And as I was thinking about this hope, this story, I thought about all of, all of the people along the way who maybe experienced that with Jesus, his disciples, his followers. Like I guess in that first Easter Sunday, when they went to that grave, they were not expecting it to be open. They were not expecting it to be empty. In their minds, they were going to work out, what do we do? Now the thing we put our hope in has failed. But yet they were surprised. And I want to put to you this morning, I think Jesus is still in the game of surprising people. Um, I want to put some images on the screen uh, that may be familiar to you some icons so as christians we have the cross and as soon as you see a cross you know exactly what that means you know what the story is you know how it ends but there are some other global symbols now that have come about does anybody know what this one is here mickey mouse this is one of the symbols for disney does anybody know what this one is here is Harry Potter, that's true. And these are two of the greatest storytellers of the last hundred years. But did you know this, that Walt Disney was bankrupt, he'd run out of ideas, he'd been rejected and cut off by anybody who might want to make him successful. And he took his last chance, surviving reportedly on just eating dog food. Anyone here eating dog food? Um... Good for you. Well done. Um, you too could be Walt Disney one day. Um, he took his last chance to get his stories and his animations told. He thought that he had failed. He thought that he'd missed his chance because he ran out of money. He ran out of opportunities. Yet to this date, 
Walt Disney's films have been nominated for 59 Academy Awards, and now Disney obviously is one of the biggest and greatest animated film studios in the world. But there was a moment in 1921 when Walt Disney thought the dream was over. The same is true for J.K. Rowling, the author of the, the Harry Potter books and series. Did you know that she was rejected by 12 publishers for the books of Harry Potter? I bet there were 12 people who lost their jobs back in 1997 when those books came out. But 12 times she was rejected. 12 times she was told, no one wants to know these books. No one wants to know this story. No one wants to buy this. No one's interested in this. Yet she now is one of the wealthiest and most well-known authors on planet Earth. What changed for her? Why did she not give up? Why did she not let that dream go? And I think there is something within each of us that when we have a purpose, when we have a dream and a vision and a, and a desire for something in our life, we very rarely let go of it easily. We, we very rarely let rejection or disappointment override it. But ultimately, for all of us, there is something that we cannot overcome. Death is coming for all of us. Failure at some point is going to be a reality for every one of us. At some point in our lives, we will make a mistake. We will let people down. We'll be late. We'll miss the deadline. This is just a reality of the human condition. And as much as we try, um, I won't mention any names, but I know a lot of people invest a lot of money in anti-aging creams. You know those creams with all those funny names from all those funny places that tell you if you know you rub this on. Yep, in the morning and in the evening, it'll take 10 years off your life. Um, uh, it's, it, we're all working hard to try and deny, to get away from this eventuality. But yet there's only Jesus who has ever offered us anything close to a real solution. And so I want to share this morning a few words from John's gospel, John chapter 20. And John was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was one of the followers of Jesus. And in his gospel, as he records this story, um, John the whole purpose of his gospel was so that we might believe, he says. And our, our vision for the church this year, this focus, this phrase that we feel God is speaking over us, is he wants us to believe. He wants us to believe who he is. He wants us to believe his promises. And he wants us to believe that we are called and significant. And so John, in his gospel, writes these words in chapter 20. I'm just going to read the first few verses. It says this, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. This is what John calls himself. Like he wrote a gospel. He named it after himself, but yet in it, he tries to play like he's really humble. He talks about the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. The other disciple, that's John. Um, and, and the one Jesus loved. And they have taken our Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter... The other disciples started from the tomb. Both were running, um, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. See how humble he is? Well, we set off. I got there first. I, it wasn't me. Uh, it was the other disciple. Someone beat Peter. Let's just say Peter came second. All right. Um, uh, and reached the tomb first. Uh, but uh, Peter uh, was the one who went in. Uh, he bent over and looked in, at the strips of linen lying there, uh, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along uh, behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, uh, as were the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The clothes were still lying in that place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Then the disciples went back to the others where they were staying. So this is the first account of the disciples and followers of Jesus going to that grave, expecting to find a grave with a body in it. 
Expecting to anoint a dead body with oil and fragrances was the custom and tradition in those days. But that moment, that morning, has changed the course of human history. That those few people in the garden, what they witnessed, has changed the course of now, currently, 2.1 billion people on planet Earth would identify and say that they were Christian. 2.1 2.1 billion right at this present moment would say that what happened in that tomb on that day has changed their life and many more through history. The thing that's so amazing about the gospel account of Jesus' life and death and resurrection is this, is if they were trying to manipulate us into thinking something that was not true, they wouldn't have told the stories the way they told it. If they were trying to deceive us into believing something that was further beyond fact, they wouldn't have told the stories the way that they told it. One of the reasons for this is in the ancient world, women were pretty much second-class citizens. Women couldn't own anything. They had no property of their own, and they could not bear witness in court. They couldn't have any legal powers. And so if... The people who wrote the Gospels, John and the others, were trying to make the point that this thing never happened, but we want you to believe it like he did. They would never use the account of women. Yet all throughout the Gospel, from Jesus' birth to his death and his resurrection, the first people to be seen and taken account and witnessing these are women. And you see, if if this story was made up, if this story was far-fetched, then they would have minimized that fact. They would have said, no, 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 all the 12 disciples were there. And they would have said the oldest one went in first. But they give this real account. The first people to go was Mary and the other women. The first people that Jesus spoke to after the resurrection was Mary when she confuses him for the gardener. Peter, the disciple that was there on that day he wrote some of the bible too and in one of his letters to the church he says this for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our lord jesus christ in power but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty there is a reality about this story that sometimes we are detached from because we still view it as a fairy tale We still view it as something distant and far from us. But I really hope that today as I share from this story that you, just like those disciples, would encounter the resurrected, the real Jesus. I love that in John's account, he he says how they all kind of arrived at different points. The women went first and noticed that something wasn't right. And then they tell the other disciples and some of them go running to find out what had happened. Yet other disciples come along later. And I think this is an amazing picture of many of our lives is that we all arrive to meet Jesus at different stages and different points. Some of us met Jesus for the first time years ago. Some of us for the first time maybe more recently. And yet some of us are perhaps still on our way to the cross, to the empty tomb. We're still on our way to meet Jesus in the story of our lives. The resurrection of Jesus is the demonstration of God's power both now and his purpose for the future. The thing about being a Christian is this, is God is not just interested in dealing with our past. God is not just interested in dealing with our present. But God is also interested in setting us up for the future. And this is what I want to draw out today, that the resurrection of Jesus has a significance and a purpose for us both now and and in the future. And there are three things that John writes about in this account that really struck me as I read it and reread it and read it again and tried to get my head around what it is that God wants to say to us this morning. The first thing we've got to understand is this. Jesus himself earlier in John's gospel said this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die and this was the declaration of jesus that his death and resurrection was the hope for all of us that he was setting a precedent he was setting a standard that we can follow into in our lives i want to say this and i think this will speak to somebody this morning so listen up the purpose of the cross and the resurrection of jesus is not to give us an easy life Sorry to say it, it's not to give us an easy life, but 
the cross and the resurrection of Jesus allow us to live at ease in every situation and circumstance. It's not about having an easy life. It's not about accepting Jesus and just sitting back and putting your feet up. But it's knowing that the power of that resurrection, the power of that hope goes and lives in us and through us every single day. We have a baptism in a few moments and we're going to celebrate the transformation, the new life that comes from choosing to follow Jesus. And the resurrection was a transformation. Jesus wasn't resuscitated. Jesus hadn't gone to A&E and they'd got the, the, the defibrillator out and brought him back from the brink of death. Jesus was dead. The reason that he laid in the tomb for three days was back 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. They didn't really have the great medical technology that we have now. So if you thought someone was dead, you just left them for a couple of days. They didn't get any better. They didn't sit up. They didn't cough or snore or sneeze. Oh, they're definitely dead. And so Jesus lay in the tomb for three days to make sure that he was definitely dead. The other thing is this. He was killed by the Romans. And uh, the Romans were good at very many things. Killing people was one of them. They were great killers of people. So I doubt that they would have made any mistakes. But even death itself couldn't hold, couldn't stop the plans and purposes of God in Jesus. So if you're taking notes, the first thing I want to tell you this. The resurrection, the purpose of the resurrection of this is to give us hope both now and in the future. It gives us hope both now and and for the future. Paul writes to one of the churches in the New Testament, maybe 30 years after the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And he writes to them and he says this, guys, you've got to understand the resurrection of Jesus is the basis, the central point of the faith that we have. Because he says this, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then there's no point in us doing anything. He says our preaching is useless. Our faith is useless. There's no value in what we are doing. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57, Paul writes this, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written, death shall be swallowed up in victory. Oh, I've jumped ahead, sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless, and, our, and so is your faith. He goes on to say, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. You see, if we don't believe in a natural, physical, literal resurrection of Jesus, then we have no basis. We have no hope. And something struck me as I read this passage this year that I hadn't noticed before, that I hadn't realized, was it talks about the folded grave clothes that were left in the tomb. And often we talk about the empty cross and the empty grave. But the truth is this, the grave wasn't empty because Jesus Christ, grave clothes were left kind of have a volunteer someone small because i've not got much not you ben we'll be here all day alex do you want to come you're smallish so in those days when somebody died um if they were wealthy enough they would be put in a tomb and jesus was not wealthy but somebody he knew was wealthy who's grateful for their rich friends um here you go hold on to that uh, Tom, you can come and help me because you can wrap him up. Um, and if you were going to be put into a tomb, you'd be wrapped up. Put your feet together. There you go. Just wrap, wrap him up in that like a mummy. Um, you'd be wrapped in grave clothes. You'd be wrapped and left in the tomb. And eventually what would happen is your body would decompose in the, in the, in the, row, in the fabric. And then they would collect your bones. And it would be your bones that would be put in a box and maybe buried or equally kept or cherished. I've got it in someone's in someone's house or someone's um, garden or somewhere like that. And so when Jesus died, he was wrapped and he was placed in this tomb. And on that morning, the women were going to anoint the body with with spices and oils, because um, if you could imagine a, a, a dead body in a hot country, um, it's going to it's going to make a smell. Um, and so they would wrap it in cloth here. Got some more, keep going. They would put your arms by your side. You're not escaping. Um, there you go, hold on to it. Keep going, go the way. Um, they, would, they would wrap it and then they would anoint it with oils and fragrances so that when people perhaps next week or next month, next year, put another body in, it wouldn't quite be as overwhelmingly gross. Um, but there's this amazing picture of 
Jesus' grave clothes in the tomb. And the reason I say this, that God is not just interested in our past, our present, but in our future, is that I want you to imagine that that on the grave clothes of Jesus was the smell of death, was the smell of sin. And as we come to celebrate and remember this Easter, the death of Jesus, that on those grave clothes left in the tomb was our sin, was our fear, was our anxiety, that actually the resurrection of Jesus moves us from one place to another. The only other resurrection we have record of in the New Testament is of Jesus' friend Lazarus, Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. And it says this, that Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave, and Lazarus literally came. I don't know how he got out of there. I'm pretty impressed. I think they should have been impressed that wrapped like this, and even more so. That's a good job. If, uh, if, if, uh, if your career as a football manager doesn't work out, Tom, embalming, there's, there's a future for you. Um, you know, Lazarus had to come out of the graves, and what they said was this, that immediately they went to Lazarus, Lazarus and started to take the grave clothes off him and and what they thought was this if they hadn't have unwrapped his body he would have suffocated and died again that the robes would have been so tight so um, well wrapped this is a great job there you go tuck it in I think people get the point thank you Tom Um, that he would have been so tightly wrapped in those strips of linen that even though his body was resurrected he was still stuck in death he was still stuck with the scent and the fragrance and, the, and, and, the, and the, the, the fabric of death. But you know, when Jesus died and rose again, he left the fabric of death in the grave. He left all of our fear. He left all of our anxiety. He left all of our sin behind. And I love this idea, and, and the gospel writers are a little bit ambiguous with it. But some of them say that as Jesus body was resurrected he would have passed through the grave clothes that when it says folded grave clothes it wasn't like jesus like you know made the bed when he got up that quite literally they would have still been set in the shape of a body as jesus passed through them and so you know when we talk about the the hope for our future it's because everything of death and fear and hate and sin and anger went to the grave with jesus got wrapped around him in that grave but when jesus was resurrected he left those things behind And I want you to know this morning that your anxiety, your worry, your struggle, your mistakes are all dealt with and left in the grave. That when you come to Jesus, you leave those things behind and you begin a new life. But some of us forget this. Some of us forget that when we choose to follow Jesus, we need to get rid of the ropes. We need to get rid of the the linen we need to unwrap ourselves and this is what we talk about with discipleship and learning to be a follower of jesus it's like we have to learn to unwrap ourselves we have to learn to to leave our old life our old choices our old things behind and walk out of the grave there you go you're free to go now james has come to help you there we go thank you alex give him a round of applause so so Jesus' resurrection is our hope for both now and the future. The second thing is this. The resurrection of Jesus gives us victory both now and for the future. Paul writes, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, grave, is your victory? You see, the death and resurrection of Jesus give us a freedom and a hope for the future that means we are no longer fearful of the consequences. We're no longer fearful yeah, they've got no words now. Thanks, mate. Um, let me sit down. You want to get up? All right, we'll go sit down then. Go sit down. We are no longer fearful of the consequences of failure. We're no longer fearful of the consequences of the end because we know that God has given us a victory. Therefore, I think this, Christians should be the most hopeful and positive people on planet Earth. Reason being is we know that no mistake, no failure, no fall, no trial or challenge is the end. If tomorrow everything in your life went wrong, we still have a hope in Jesus. That actually God has a plan and that he's working it out and working through it. That it's not relying on us being successful. It's not relying on us to have the answers to to everything. That even in the midst of our own frailty and failures, we can claim and hold on to the victory of the cross we can hold on to the victory of jesus the last thing is this the resurrection 
is both power for now and for the future. Romans 8 verse 11 says this, And if the same Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you, then he will give life to your mortal bodies because the Spirit who lives in you. You see, it was the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus was all made possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul writes to the church in Rome and says the same spirit, the same power that took Jesus from death and brought him back to life is available and at work in each and every one of us. Jesus said to his disciples, if I don't go away, then the one who comes after me is not able to come. And this is the the power that is available to all of us, that actually the Spirit of God can be at work within us, that whatever challenge, whatever situation, whatever circumstance we face, that the same power that took Jesus from death and brought him back to life can be at work in us and through us. And so I want to finish with this thought, with this quote from a a, a famous uh, Christian preacher and teacher that I came across when I googled quotes for Easter but this is a good one I felt like sharing it this is from John Wesley and he says this I want the whole Christ for my savior the whole Bible for my book the whole church for my fellowship and the whole world for my mission field and I thought that summed up so wonderfully the purpose to believe the purpose of the resurrection is this is to believe everything about jesus as our lord and savior to say i want the whole jesus not just the bits i like not just the bits i understand not just the bits i remember i want the whole jesus he says i want the whole bible not just the bits i like not just the bits i agree with not just the bits i can remember i want the whole of god's story to be mine. I want the whole of his wisdom to be mine. I want the whole of his instruction to be mine. He says, I want the whole church for my fellowship. Again, not just the people I like, not just the people I agree with, not just the people whose names I can remember, but I want the whole church. And then I love this last one. He says, I want the whole world as my mission field. That this is the purpose of the resurrection, that we can have all of Jesus, that we can have all all of the word that we can have all of the fellowship and communion of saints that we can have all of the world that wherever you are wherever you're living working called to reaching whatever you're doing you too can see the the spirit of jesus at work in you because of the resurrection you see without the resurrection we would be limited to only being in the place of the time that jesus was but as the holy spirit is at work within all of us we can be Jesus we can be church anywhere and everywhere so before we come to our baptism I want to finish by just inviting us to respond just simply one of two ways this morning would you just stand with me as I pray over us and um, just want to ask you do you feel in one of two groups of people this morning do you feel in like those disciples do you feel you're you've arrived at the tomb Do you feel like you've arrived with an expectation? And maybe your expectations in life have not been met. Maybe you feel like you're here today as a last chance, as a last hope. Maybe there are things going on in your world and you think, well, if God doesn't turn this thing around, then I don't know what I'm going to do. Then I'd love to pray for you that you would experience, that you would hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you today. That you would know that same power, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead at work in you and your life. Or maybe you're part of the the other group of those who I feel maybe are still on their way to meet the resurrected Jesus. Maybe you're still on your way to that. Maybe you wouldn't say you're a Christian today. Maybe you wouldn't say you found that peace and that hope and that joy that we've talked about. But maybe you want to. But maybe you want to know that in your life. I don't know everybody here. I don't know every detail of your life, but I believe that God does. And I know that this, that God would not have brought you here this morning to hear what I shared if you were not in one place or the other, if you were not ready to experience his Holy Spirit in a new and powerful way because of the resurrection, or equally if God wanted to speak and introduce himself to you at the first for the first time. So if you 
are still on your way to meeting Jesus, then we have a prayer that we pray at the end of many of our services. And it's simply an invitation. It's simply a way that you can invite Jesus into your life, into your world. The words are going to come up. I'll let, there they are on the screen. And I want us to all pray these words out loud together. And then if you're part of the second group, I'll tell you how we're going to pray together uh, in a second. So let's say these words together this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your grace to forgive me and your love to change me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me for the sin in my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. With your help, I will live for you. Amen. So I just want to invite everybody to just to close your eyes, just to bow your heads for a few moments and just reflect on what we've sung. Reflect on what you've heard. Maybe reflect on what you've just prayed. And if you feel like you want to take that step of faith this morning, if you want to make that prayer your own, then, then while every eye is closed, every head is bowed, I'm just going to ask you to raise a hand. Firstly, so that I can see it, it helps me because I've got a gift that we love to give people as they respond and say this prayer for the first time, but also to help you, to give you a moment that in the future, this week, this month, you can look back on and say, yeah, I prayed that prayer. On Sunday, the 9th of April, I put my hand up and I invited Jesus into my life. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning and you want to invite Jesus into your life, you want to meet him for the first time, then simply just raise your hand. Just raise it up where you are. That's great. And then pop it back down again. And I would love to give you a gift, a free gift. We've got a book that we give. And just pray with you. Just help you on this journey. Help you know how you can walk with God. That's great. Thank you. So the other group this morning, if you feel like you want to experience, you want to meet the, the, the resurrected Jesus, maybe others have arrived before you. Maybe you're a little bit slower in the race. But you know, Jesus didn't just appear to Peter or John or Mary. He made sure that he met and spoke with each and every one of his disciples. So if you want to um, experience something of that resurrection power this morning, then I just invite you to hold your hands out. Just simply hold them out before you as a, as a symbol, as a sign of, of being ready, of wanting to receive. In, in John's gospel, he goes on just after these moments of encountering the resurrected Jesus. He goes on to pray for them. He goes on to, to speak over them and I want to do that over us this morning for those of you who are who are holding hands out ready to know the same power that raised Jesus from the dead Lord I pray for every person who has their hands outstretched to you this morning ready to receive and respond to you Lord we thank you for your death we thank you for your resurrection Lord we thank you for the hope both now and for the future and Lord, I pray that on this Easter Sunday, this would be a significant point in our lives, that we would look back to know that we heard your voice. Lord, that we would look back to know that we sensed your presence. Lord, to know that we saw you at work in our lives. And so I pray for each one here today, that they would know the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead at work, living in them. Lord, that you would bring life, heavenly life, to, to their bodies, to their marriages, to their families, to their work situations, to their home situations, to their financial situations. Lord, I pray that you would breathe life into um, people who are struggling with, with sickness today, physical sickness. Lord, those who are struggling with mental health, Lord, I pray you would breathe your life into us. Lord, that we would be those people who are not phased by the circumstances and situations of this life, but we would live at ease because we know you are with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.